as you probably know, if you've had any conflict at all, which I, if there's anybody here who's never experienced conflict, I want to talk to you after um, the session. One of the things that is just sort of a feature of conflict is emotion. And that emotion can be really positive because oftentimes it helps us to realize how we feel about something. It many times will bring us to the table, but strong emotion can also, in fact, most of the time, really kind of throw a wrench into our ability to effectively manage conflicts. And so the ability to de-escalate um, in effective ways is so important. We are really fortunate today um, to have with us Molly Grisham. And I will tell you, there, there isn't a lot out there that's really good in terms of de-escalating emotions and, and conflict. And Molly is the owner and lead facilitator of um, mollygrisham.com. She is a former soccer coach. She's also um, a professor and does a lot of very innovative and important consulting in terms of teams and team development, working with groups and organizations who are experiencing conflicts. So I'm now going to shut up and I'm going to throw it over to Molly Grisham. And I think you're going to enjoy this a lot. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Shar. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you all. I see a few familiar faces. I finished up my uh, grad certificate in conflict resolution, and I see some former classmates here. Although we never met face to face, we only met over Zoom. Uh, but it's good to see some familiar faces. As Shar said, I work with a lot of different teams in all different industries. Um, so I still work a lot in athletics, but I work a lot in higher ed. Um, I work with realtors. I've been working a lot in the biomedical space doing leadership development. But I often describe my work is the stuff that any team uh, needs to work on, that if they do it well, it's like they have a wide open smooth road. They can go as far and as fast as they want to go. If they do this stuff poorly, it's like speed bump after speed bump after speed bump. And there's really two ways you can approach a speed bump. You can either slow down, and teams and organizations don't like that. Ugh, we got to slow down again. We got to have a meeting. We got to have a committee. We got to talk about this thing. Or you plow through it. And just like in your car, when you plow through a speed bump, if you've ever accidentally done that, I have, you do a lot of damage. And so I really love to help groups figure out what's the stuff we need to deal with so that we have a wide open road in front of us. And so a part of my work, there's always an element of conflict resolution because anytime you put a group of people together, there's a chance there's going to be some conflict. And so decided to do the graduate, graduate certificate and what a gift that has been for my clients to now have some better tools and some better resources available for them. So this last fall, I had one course left to take and I reached out to Shar and said, I'm just really curious about de-escalation. And it doesn't look like there's a lot out there. Uh, I didn't see a lot in the courses that were offered this fall that would touch on that. In fact, I looked at other institutions to see, is this something other institutions were offering? And there just wasn't a lot. And I said, I'd like to do an independent study and just do a deep dive and see what I learn. And so really what I'm going to share with you today is what I learned this fall. I would not consider myself an expert after one semester of doing a deep dive, but I certainly know more now than I did last August. And so I'm excited to share that work with you. Um, kind of our roadmap for today is I'm going to share what I've learned. At the end, I'll share some resources, um, some of the books that I found to be really helpful. And then I've also got a free thing I want to give you. So if you stick around, I'll give you a free thing as well. I think free stuff is always useful or helpful. So let me pull up my screen share. We're going to get rolling here. 
I want to start with a little bit of an interactive slide for you. So on the screen, you see a bunch of emojis. And I'd like for you to put in the chat window, which of these emojis best describes how you are feeling right now? Not how you would like to feel or how you'll feel after 5 p.m. today, but how do you feel right now? This will give me a sense of where the group is at, how we're doing today. Oh, oh, we've got a lot of number fives, a 10, okay. We are all over the map, okay? Those of you that aren't having the best day, I'm watching these come in. I'm hoping it's gonna get better in the next hour. I hope this is worth your time. So this is a tool that I use when I meet with groups. Uh, if I do it on Zoom or if I meet face-to-face, -face. if we meet face-to-face, -face, I would print these out, put them all over the room and ask people to go stand by the one that best represents how they're feeling. And I think that's important for us anytime we're facilitating that we just have a sense of how's everybody doing, that that may change how we want to approach something and may change our energy level a little bit. The other tie back that I think is really interesting for this group is often when I do this, particularly when it's face to face and we've got people all over the room, generally someone will say, wait a second, that's what that emoji means? Oh my gosh, I've been using it wrong the whole time. And that's always an interesting kind of entry point for me to say to someone or to say to a team, gosh, no wonder communication is so hard. Like we can't even get our emojis right. We, we, I guarantee if you all pulled out your phones right now, we've already all used emojis today and we don't even agree on what that means. And so when you add in language and culture and nonverbal, it's really complex to communicate with people in effective ways. So it's a good reminder uh, that communication is hard. And if we can't even agree on these emojis and what they mean, no wonder we struggle to communicate with everyone else. So regardless of where you're at, how you're feeling, I hope this next uh, 45 minutes or so is productive and useful for you. So let's dive in. So I want to give you one more opportunity to put something in the chat window, and that's this. When you think about the concept of de-escalation, what are the industries or fields that come to mind for you? So in other words, where could de-escalation techniques be applied? I would love to see some of your thoughts in the chat window. I don't think there's right and wrong to this. Yep, counseling, housing, law enforcement, board meetings, education, uh, policing, retail, social work, personal relationships, parenting, yes, legal. These are excellent. Okay, this is exactly what I thought you would say. And this was something that as my research kind of unfolded this last semester, it really became clear to me that this is information that is needed in nearly every industry. And there are certainly some that came to mind right away, like policing, like education, like uh, the legal system, healthcare. But I would be hard pressed to think that there's an industry where we would say like, no, 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 don't learn about de-escalation. It won't be useful for you. Uh, it really does seem to me that there's a wide open path in terms of the places and industries where these techniques and this concept can be applied. So one of the things that was really interesting to me as I started kind of at ground zero in my research was this idea that it seems like there are two kind of categories of de-escalation. And, and I didn't in my research notice anyone naming these two categories, but I certainly am someone, I think in bullet points, I think in post-it notes. And so as I was reading, I found myself saying, well, this goes in this category and this goes in this category. And so the two things that I really noticed is, let's talk about this first category. That would be someone who is a trained professional, uh, a trained mediator, a trained hostage negotiator. It's someone who this is their profession to help a situation deescalate. Uh, the person that they're working with is probably already in a heightened state of arousal. 
the, the situation has already gotten to a bad place. There is the potential of a weapon or a threat or physical harm. Uh, it could be towards themselves or to others, but there's likely some sort of threat there. And it's likely that that professional is negotiating with a stranger. And so this would be what we would stereotypically think of as a hostage negotiation. It's public. Um, this is probably what we hear about on the news. And so one of the quotes that I came across was this, hostage negotiation can be summarized in one word, communication. And, th and I share that because we're going to hear that regardless of the context, um, as I kind of share this information with you today. But even at the hostage negotiation level, it all boils down to communication. So we have that scenario. And then we have probably what the rest of us are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So not necessarily a professional trained at a really high level. Maybe we have a little information. We've taken some communication or some conflict resolution courses, or you sat here today, but not highly trained in the field of de-escalation. Uh, the person we're working with is in a potential state of arousal. So they're not there yet, but we have a sense things could head that direction. There are hopefully no weapons involved, uh, maybe not a severe physical threat to themselves or to others. And the two people might know each other. So we could think of that as a teacher and a student. We could think of it as a couple that's in a relationship, uh, but it's likely these two people know each other in some capacity. And so for most of us on the call today, we probably fall into category two. Now, for me, I experienced what, what I would call a light bulb moment. So it's those moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, how did I not see this? Like, God, this makes so much sense to me. So one of the things I've noticed, particularly with my clients, and, and I've been doing this work full time for the last five years, but I hear from my clients all the time, Molly, I don't know how to have a hard conversation. Like, how do I bring this up? How do I talk to this person? Oh, I just don't know how to do it. And the first couple of years, I, I tried to help people with that. And then I stopped because I felt like something was off. I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Uh, and I felt like there are professionals who write tons of books and do lectures on how to have a hard conversation. So what's the issue here? Like, what are we really dealing with? Why has this problem not been solved? For me, that light bulb moment was, I think a lot of people fear a hard conversation because what they really fear is that it's going to escalate and they don't know what to do about it. And that for me has changed how I think about this idea of having a hard conversation because we can talk about tone and timing and listening. We can talk about that all day long, but if the root fear is it's going to escalate and I'm not going to know what to do, then we're not actually solving the right problem. And when I think about the conversations that I've been scared to have in my life, that really has been the root cause. I don't know how they're going to react. What if it gets out of control? And what if I don't know what to do about it? So I avoid those conversations. Uh, so maybe that's helpful for you as you think about hard conversations that you need to have or, or people in your particular environment. Is the fear really that things might escalate and we don't know what to do about it? If so, this is going to be super useful, helpful information for people. So let's continue here. So let's think a little bit about this concept of someone moving in a state of arousal. So I love this quote. Uh, it was from one of what I would consider to be the top three books that I read uh, for this research. But as an individual escalates their aggressive behaviors, they are priming their bodies to posture, to intimidate, to fight or flee. So it's important for us to understand that as we see their behavior shifting, they're getting ready for a fight. And, and we've got to remember that if we are. Um, I'll, I'll probably use the word mediating or listening or helping because there certainly is a difference in terms of what, how we would normally define mediation. But if we're showing up on the scene to help someone, uh, we've got to remember that this is, this is what's happening in their body. They, they are getting ready to fight 
something. So there are some really specific behaviors we can look for that will help us understand, is this where they're headed? So one of the first things would be, does their behavior seem really disorganized and erratic? Like, do we look at that situation and think, what the heck are they doing? Like, that doesn't, it doesn't make sense the way they're behaving. So that's an indicator that they're moving in that state of arousal towards a crisis situation for them. Um, is their language really hostile? Um, maybe more so than normal if this is someone that we know, but does the language seem over the top? Okay, they're moving in that direction. Does their body language seem really nervous or anxious? That's another hint, another clue for us. Um, are they hyper reactive to everything that's happening around them? Does it seem like every little movement they are reacting to in some way? And so there are some, also some just subtle physical clues that we can look for as we're kind of studying that situation. Um, are they clenching their jaw? If you're getting ready to fight, you're probably clenching your jaw. So is that happening for them? Um, are they avoiding eye contact? Because they're probably hyper-reactive to everything else. They're looking in all different directions. So how is their eye contact? Um, what does their face look like in terms of it being flushed? Does it look like the color of their face is changing a little bit? And do we notice that their breathing pattern is changing at all? Suddenly, are they starting to breathe a whole lot faster? When you think about a moment where you've been really scared, where you think, I got to fight for myself, I'm fighting for, for my life in this moment, those things naturally happen to us. Our jaw gets clenched, we're breathing faster. So we've got to be as someone kind of showing up on the scene, really aware. We've got to be able to study what's happening to someone else's body so that we have a sense of what direction things are headed. Now, this was really fascinating to me to think about what's happening to someone's brain in a crisis situation. So it's really important to understand that in that crisis, when they feel backed into a corner, when they're getting ready to fight, what is happening in their brain is the part of the brain that is logical and rational and makes good decisions has been powered down. They literally don't have access to that part of their brain. So Comments like, just relax, just stop and think for a second, just make a logical, rational decision, do no good, because they literally don't have access to the part of the brain that will help them relax and think about it and make a good decision. So if we show up and take that approach, here, I'm going to help you, I just need you to relax, take a breath and be logical, we're doing more harm than good. They literally can't tap in to that part of their brain. So I think this is also a good reminder, um, for me at least, because I am a very logical, rational person. I often struggle when there's a whole lot of emotion involved. I would rather tap into that logical side. Uh, it is helpful for me in that moment when I'm feeling like there's so much emotion in this moment that that's all that person has access to. And it feels like it's all emotionally driven because that's all they have to communicate with. So again, it's a good reminder for me because I would much rather negotiate with the logical, rational part of someone and they don't have access to that. And so I've got to kind of let go of that expectation and just recognize this is what's happening in their brain and how can I help them with a the part of their brain that they do have access to. So let's talk a little bit about our goal as, as the mediator, as the listener, as the helper in that moment. This was very clear in all of the research that I did. The goal is to reduce an individual's sense of danger. And we really, really have to have clarity when we're helping someone that that's what our goal is. If, if we show up with a particular outcome in mind, other than this, we're probably setting ourselves 
up for failure. So a few thoughts on that. Uh, one is they're not going to make progress if they feel alone, if they feel backed into a corner, or if they're fear fearing for their own physical safety. <clears throat> so we've got to be aware of <clears throat> what's the danger that they're feeling right now. And to recognize that if they're feeling that way, they probably feel like they need to defend themselves as well. So if we can alleviate a little bit of that danger, we've got a chance to resolve this situation. Um, we really need to, to be intentional, again, about not having a predefined outcome in our minds. So it's not, well, I'm going to show up and this will take exactly 10 minutes and then I'm going to get them to make this exact decision and this is how it's going to be resolved. We just have to help them navigate this danger that they're feeling. And the danger likely doesn't make any sense to us because, again, they haven't tapped into the logical, rational part of their brain. So we've really got to be intentional about setting aside what's my agenda in this moment and, again, make their sense of danger the highest priority. All right. So when we show up on the scene... Not only are we studying someone else at a really high level, we've talked about all that body language that we're paying attention to for them. We also have to be really aware of what we are bringing to the situation because by showing up, we are potentially changing things. So I loved this quote. Again, this was from uh, one of the three books that I will recommend at the end. And it says, our own feelings during a crisis situation give us a powerful clue about what's going on with the other person. And this gives us an opportunity to open up more options for constructive responses and helps us avoid doing something counterproductive. So what I love about that is it's not asking us to ignore or turn off our feelings when we're helping someone, but instead we're using them almost like scientific evidence. It's clues to what's going on in this moment. And so we really have this opportunity to study uh, what are we feeling and how does that help us understand what someone else might be feeling. So we need to make sure that we use those as clues to what's going on, but we can't get sucked in to what's going on in that moment. So that brings us to this concept of emotional contagion. And this happens when we start to take on the feelings of someone else. So imagine in a crisis situation, we've got one person who's really, really escalating. They're really in a state of arousal. Things are moving dangerously. And then we join them in that. And now we have two people <laughs> and we want to avoid that at all cost. So we've got to make sure that again, we're in tune with their feelings, but we're not taking on their feelings as our own. We're really using those almost like scientific evidence and assessing the situation on a little bit deeper level. Now, one of the things that, again, we have to be really, really aware of is our body language that we bring to a situation. And so some really, really important things here. We have to be aware that our body language and our physical presence can absolutely impact the de-escalation process. We've just changed that environment. Again, if you think of it like a scientific experiment, where you're pouring things into a beaker, we just brought something into that scientific experience just by showing up on the scene. So our physical presence can change things. So a few things that we need to be aware of is one, how is our own breath? Are we starting to mimic the breathing patterns of the person that we're working with? And in turn, is that causing a state of arousal for ourselves? Or are we breathing? Are we relaxed? Are we teaching them what that breathing pattern needs to look like? So who's kind of in control of what the breath looks like? Are we taking on theirs or are they taking on us? So really being intentional about that, super, super important. We also need to be aware of sudden movements that we might have. So again, remember, we're talking about someone who is potentially 
quite hyper reactive. So their eyes are darting everywhere. It's fear, fear, fear everywhere they look. And if we make a sudden movement, that could absolutely set them off. It could derail the trust that we're building with them. And we could be moving backwards in this process of trying to de-escalate. And then another thing that I thought was really interesting is the idea of personal space and how close or how far we need to be from the person who is potentially moving in this state of arousal. So we need to make sure that we're close enough that we have a connection with them and far enough that we're not encroaching on their personal space or putting ourselves in harm's way. And to me, that means that every single de-escalation is very contextualized and that answer is going to be different for every situation. In my research, no one said, uh, yes, you should always be four to six feet away. There just wasn't a right answer because you can certainly think a situation where physical violence or a weapon may be involved, we've got to really be at a distance. And I'll share with you in a moment some, some examples of when we actually might want to be really, really close to that person. So being aware of how close or how far we need to be from that person can be really, really helpful. And again, that's where we can't get wrapped up in our own emotions and what we want in that moment. We've got to really read and assess what the other person needs. Okay, so let me give you some specific techniques that I found really interesting. And so this first is this concept of affect labeling. That was directly from the book that a couple of you are getting. You can tell from my tabs um, I found a lot of value in that book because I marked a lot of things here. But that author really talks about how our role is to help someone else identify what they're feeling in the moment. And so his approach, I thought, was really interesting and really counterintuitive to, a, what, a, to what I've been taught in most communication contexts, but it makes a whole lot of sense to me. So imagine someone is... Uh, feeling fearful, they're feeling alone, they feel backed into a corner, but because they can't tap into that logical, rational part of their brain, they don't know how to say, I'm feeling fear in this moment. They, they've lost that ability to do that. And so one of the things that we can do in that moment is help them name what they're feeling. Now, the approach that the author suggested was that we use you statements not I statements. And this, I had to like really flip my brain because I've always been taught in a hard conversation, don't tell the other person what, the, what they're feeling. You use I statements. I say things like I'm feeling alone and I'm feeling not heard. And I, like you own your feelings, but this person can't do that. They can't tap into that part of their brain. And so what he really suggests is in the moment, ignore the words that are being said. Because the words are probably irrational, illogical, uh, erratic. They just don't make sense. And what he really encouraged was listen to the emotion behind the words. And again, that's a change for me. I'm always, I've always been taught, like, really pay attention to what someone is saying. And he's saying, ignore that. Just listen to the emotion so that you can reflect back to them what you're hearing. And so that looks like this. You're listening, 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 and you say, you feel very alone in this moment. And that feels like a very bold move in a crisis situation to look at someone and say, you feel fill in the blank. What he says will happen, and I believe this to be true, is they will either say, oh, yeah, that's exact, yes. Thank you. That's exactly how I feel. And we've brought that situation down. Or they're going to say, no, that's not how I feel. And they're going to give you more information. And so we go through that process again. Ignore the words. It's probably not making sense. Continue to listen to the emotion. And you say, you're feeling underappreciated. Again, it's either, oh, thank you. Yes, that's exactly how I feel. Finally, someone understands me. Or no, that's not how I feel. Let me give you more information. But we are reflecting back to them what they are feeling in that moment because they can't name it for themselves. The other thing that was interesting is the author talked a lot about removing the I statements because um, there is no room for us 
in this process. There is no room for our ego. There is no room for how I feel. My sole focus is on helping this person deal with the fear and the danger that they're feeling. And so for me to say, well, here's how I feel in this moment, or let me tell you what I'm experiencing. He actually said, there's just no room for that. Your focus is solely on you feel this, you're experiencing this, you're experiencing that. Uh, and again, that's a, that's a change for me because in so many hard conversations or just kind of adult conversations I've had to have with people, it's all about, let me tell you how I feel. And then you tell me how you feel. And there's a balance there. But in a crisis situation like this, that balance really goes out the window and we're solely focused on them. Um, another piece that he suggested was this idea that we should gaze, not glare. And so when we're thinking about eye contact, it was highly suggested that we, um, we don't want to break eye contact because, again, if someone is hyperreactive and suddenly we look off, they're going to say, what's the danger that you're looking at? And that could set them off. So we want to keep our eye contact. We also want to do that for our own safety, particularly if this is someone that's maybe on the verge of a psychotic break or there is a weapon involved. We need to keep our eyes there. But staring right into their eyeballs, like peering into their soul, could be very overwhelming for someone in that moment. And so we're looking more at their, their face. We're gazing towards them, not that piercing, intimidating uh, power dynamic type of eye contact. I know there have been situations in my life, not necessarily a crisis situation like this, but where someone would not break eye contact with me and it was really intimidating. Like I felt like they were using it as a power move. And so we just have to be intentional. We're looking in their direction, but we're not trying to use that as a power move. And then the last thing that I think we can really, really be aware of is Western culture uh, certainly values extroversion. And it's typically assumed that if you're talking, you're the most powerful person in the room. And we have to be aware of that when we're helping someone come out of a crisis moment, that if we dominate the conversation, if we fill all of the silence, we are asserting our power. We're saying that I'm the most important person here. And so being willing to embrace some silence is really important in a crisis situation. And it does a handful of things. One is some silence just may allow everybody to relax a little bit. That can be a really positive thing. It can also allow that person in crisis to fill the silence with a little bit more of what they need. And so if we feel like oh, silence is awkward for us, I'm just going to fill it with words, we might not be getting the information we need to be able to help someone move forward. And so that silence can be really powerful. Um, but the silence can also be an opportunity for a person to start to brainstorm about what they need. If we've been able to bring them down a little bit, if there's some maybe co-regulation going on and they're starting to relax and they're starting to tap into that part of their brain, the silence may allow them to say, actually, what I really need in this moment is a glass of water. Great. It's a great place for us to start. Let's get you that. So silence can be a really, really helpful thing in those moments. Uh, again, I think our culture is, is so silence. Um, what's the right word? We just don't like it. <laughs> we really, really don't in Western culture. And so allowing some space for that is really, really important. And then there may be, as this process unfolds, an opportunity to ask some questions. Probably not right out of the gates. Again, our priority is to help them minimize the danger, minimize the fear that they are feeling. But we may get to a point where we could ask a question of them. We really need to make sure we, we focus on open questions. And for me, that's kind of a three-part thought process. One is, um, is it a question that I don't know the answer to? Because if I do know the answer, I'm probably leading them to that. Uh, is it a yes or no answer? That's probably not going to be helpful. And do I have a specific outcome in my mind? Well, I will ask them this and then they will do that. Um, it really has to be an open slate. So something as simple as, uh, is there anything you need in this moment? You, you think about the hostage negotiations you see on TV. 
what's the first thing the hostage negotiator does? They introduce themselves and they say, what do you need? What are your demands? What would you like? And again, sometimes it's as simple as you need some water. You haven't eaten all day. Let's get you some food. But a really open question where you're, where you're letting them know, I'm not in control here. I'm not trying to dictate or force anything. I really want to give you the opportunity to tell me what you need. It's really, really powerful. So let's look at a couple of specific industries and some ways that those industries uh, might approach de-escalation. So certainly education would benefit from this, from all ages. Um, when we think about education and de-escalation, we have to recognize that the students that we're working with may have chronic needs that are building to these crisis moments. And so a lot of times students are labeled as difficult, as a behavior issue, a problem child, but the reality is there may be some chronic needs behind the scenes that we are unaware of. And in de-escalating a moment with a student, we may have a sense of awareness of uh, what are these chronic needs. Um, I think that we ask a whole lot of educators, we ask them to be the entire social support system for our young person. But understanding that when we do bring a student down to a healthier place, we may have to be willing to step in and address a system that is causing chronic issues for them. We also have to recognize that an educator may in the moment help to de-escalate a student, but they may need to hand that off to someone else in the same way that we don't expect an educator to be perfect at teaching every single subject. We often take a team approach. We may need to take a team approach in handling a student who's continuing to have these crises. And so being willing to say like, whew, I, I got him down to a healthy place, but I think the guidance counselor is the one that needs to take it from here. Or I think my partner teacher, or I think the principal, but giving yourself permission to say you don't have to be the one to own that long-term process of helping that student, uh, you can hand that off to someone else. You may have started that process, um, but you may not be the one to finish it. Now, one of the things that was really interesting to me that was specific to healthcare was how does this work show up with someone with Alzheimer's or dementia? And that was not something that was really on my radar, but it showed up in my research. And that was really interesting to me. And this was the, the context or the example that I mentioned a few minutes ago of where actually being physically close to someone was a really positive thing. And so one of the, the people that I came across really said that with someone with Alzheimer's, like you're going to have to touch them. You're going to have to to grab their hand and help bring them back into their body. We certainly wouldn't do that in a hostage situation, but helping someone to return to their body and to understand that they're in a safe space when again, they, they are not able to tap into all of that in their brains can be a really positive thing. Um, this particular uh, occupational therapist, her name was Tipa Snow, and she really just talked about this process that she uses of just placing her hand on top of someone else's hand. And, and it's, it's done loosely, so you're not confining or locking them down, but that just kind of brings them back to their body and can help them deal with that sense of danger. And then certainly law enforcement. I was not surprised that this showed up quite a bit in my research, but it was interesting to me that it seemed like a separate category. And, and there certainly are some things that are different about law enforcement that we have to keep in mind. So one of the things is anytime you show up to a situation that is escalating and you have guns, you have government issued weapons, you're changing the dynamic of that situation. There's just, there's no way to, to argue against that. If I'm in fear and I feel like I'm in danger and someone shows up with a weapon, you may have just reinforced the fear that I'm feeling. And yet we ask officers to do this on a regular basis. So there are a couple of things that officers may need to keep in mind. Um, 
one of the things was this idea that the person in crisis may feel like you actually don't care about me. You're just here because somebody else called 911. And so this approach that the officers have to take of saying, I, I really do want to work with you. I really want to help you in this moment um, because there is that sense of you're only here because you have to be here. You're not here because you actually care about me. And so figuring out a path to communicate to that person that you really do care is going to be important for them. You may also need to really be aware um, of how close and how far <laughs> you are from that person. Again, when weapons are involved, that's a different component. But the other piece that, that police officers would have to think about that you and I wouldn't have to think about, assuming that you are not a police officer, uh, is how long can you allow this process to go on from a public safety perspective? So if, if I'm having uh, a, a colleague that's in crisis, I, it doesn't matter if this conversation takes a half hour, an hour, an hour and a half, that's okay. I, I can walk with you through that. But if the police are involved and we're talking about public safety, they may have to put a time limit on it. So if this is a moment that's happening, let's say in a, an outdoor restaurant and there are lots of people around and there's a threat of a weapon or a threat of harm, an officer might not be able to say like, we've got hours because from a public safety perspective, they actually might not have hours to deal with that. Um, so they've got to think really carefully about how they handle that. But the upside for police um, is certainly when they can de-escalate, their lives are probably safer and the public's lives are safer as well. And in doing so, we certainly increase and build trust. And so I think, I think there is a whole lot of room for growth in, in how we train people who show up to a scene with weapons uh, because it just, it, it puts them in a dangerous position. We already have someone who feels in danger. We already have someone who feels attacked. You've showed up with a weapon and that situation just got worse when you want to do the opposite. And so I think really working with law enforcement on this has an opportunity to change some things in really, really powerful and positive ways. And then another thing that we need to be aware of are just the power dynamics that exist between someone who's trying to help and that person that is in crisis. So empowering someone to determine for themselves the outcome of their conflict is part of the design of the mediation process and the skill set of talented mediators. So once again, this reinforces this idea that we can't show up with our agenda. We can't show up thinking this is going to take 10 minutes and this is the outcome I'm going to create. Our focus has to be solely on what does this person who is in crisis, who is really struggling, what do they need in that moment and how can I address the danger and the fear that they're feeling so that their body can regulate, so that they can access the logical, rational part of their brain and move forward. But we can't show up thinking I'm in control. I've got the training, I know what I'm doing, I'm gonna take over this situation. We actually have to do the opposite. We have to be super humble and thinking about what does this person who may be a stranger need in this moment and how can I help them? So let me, let me summarize a couple of things. Let me share some resources and my contact info, and then we'll see what questions we have. I know we've had some hands raised and we might have something in the chat window, but if there's something I can address for you, we will do that as well. So a couple of kind of summarizing thoughts. Uh, I think that understanding de-escalation really has the potential to transform lives. And when we use a phrase like transform lives, that seems pretty grand. I don't think it's an overstatement. I think having an awareness and being able to show up in these moments when someone is having the worst day of their life. This is it. This is the breaking point for them. And we have an opportunity to change that outcome. I do think that transforms lives for people. Um, escalation can seem scary, but really having a baseline knowledge of techniques, I think, can be really helpful in moving what could feel like a very stressful 
an intention filled moment in a different direction. And that doesn't have to be a hostage negotiation. That could be a a salary negotiation when you're thinking, I don't know how this is going to go over. This could get out of hand. Okay, I've got some baseline knowledge. I have some tools that I can work with. And then I think lastly, there is ample space in our culture for de-escalation techniques across all industries with all different ages, whether it's hostage negotiation or it's just our day-to-day -day life. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I would say in the last two years, as I have lived what has felt like solitary confinement at moments, I have not had my best days. I've, I've had some moments the last two years that I look back and think, good gracious, I need to go back to the grocery store and find that worker and apologize. Like, what was I? I snapped. I wasn't at my best. Um, I just haven't been my best the last two years. And I think a lot of us probably feel that way. And if we can meet each other where we are and recognize some of those moments of, gosh, that's somebody who's having a rough day. Can I just make it a little bit better and apply some of these techniques? Um, I think is really, really helpful. I think there's plenty of space for that in our culture. So let me mention three. These would be the top three books um, that I found in my research, and I'll share all my research in just a moment. You might need a magnifying glass to see it all on the screen, but these three were my top. So if you could only pick one, I would go with the second one listed, Deescalate. I found it to be a combination of being a simple read with good information. So this is the kind of book um, you can knock it out in a couple of hours. It's not going to take you weeks to read. So depending on what your comfort level is with reading, if you're, if you're like, I can read one, I would start here. Um, the other two I would rank Talk to Me would be next on the list. You can see here I've, I've got lots of tabs on that one too. Um, this really focuses on educators. So if you're in the education space, this one might be good for you. And then I would put Words of Power uh, third on the list for me. The subtitle is A Guide for Ordinary People to Calm and Deescalate Aggressive Individuals. So if you're not looking for maybe an industry specific, but you're looking for some general information, I would put that third on the list. Um, here is where I got most of my information this semester. Uh, if, and I think we're recording this, so you'll, you'll have that slide. But if it would be helpful for me to send that to any of you, I would be glad to do that. And then I want to share two more slides, and then we'll come off a of slide share and see if I can answer anything for you. So first, I want you to have my contact information. I always tell people I never want to be the kind of speaker that says, here's what I know. Good luck. You're on your own. You'll never see me again. I don't want to be that kind of person. So if I can be a resource for you in any way, uh, the QR code is for my mailing list. Uh, every other Wednesday, I send out what I call light bulb moments, which are just kind of stories and things I'm learning from my clients and how they might be helpful for you. So if you want to connect with me, in any of these ways, please feel free to do so. And then the last thing I'll share with you, this is the free thing I will share with you. Uh, next week is my birthday, and I'm a big fan of giving gifts on my birthday. And so I'm doing a five-day free email boot camp. And so every day next week, you will get an email from me. Embedded in the email is a one to two minute video on leadership or culture or team building. It's a lot of personal growth stuff. And there will be some self-reflection questions in there. So if you are thinking about personal growth and how you just want to be better as a human being and you like free stuff, just scan that code. Would love to have you join me in the boot camp next week. Um, I launched the registration yesterday and already have 130 people signed up. So I'm super excited about that, but would love to have some of you in the boot camp. Again, it is free. So I'm going to come off of screen share. Um, if I need to come back to any of this, you can ask me to. I'll be glad to. But let's, uh, let's pause for a moment. And, and Char or Heather, if you want to take over on the questions, that would be great. I'll let Heather do that, but I had an aha moment, Molly. Um, every time that Heather and I have taken students abroad to the UK, um, 
I'm always taken aback that the police don't have guns. I, I know that obviously is, is a cultural issue for me, but what you just said a moment ago about how a police person having a gun, mm -hmm. it, not using it, but just yeah. having it right. changes the whole dynamics. That was, that was a powerful moment for mm -hmm. me. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I'm glad that was helpful. And Erica had a hand up. Hey, thanks. Hi, Molly. Thanks for doing this. I've really appreciated it. I was looking at the, um, the slide where you talked about our body posture. And in healthcare, they teach us that part of that body posture is to make yourself small. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you saw anything like that in there. And then I saw somebody comment about two-year-olds and like, you would want to get down to their level yes. and be eye to eye. But in healthcare, you want to make yourself small, but near a door so you can get out if you need. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, two, okay, so two thoughts. One was specific to the person who was talking about working with Alzheimer's or dementia patients. She did mention, you're probably gonna kneel and get eye contact level with them. So I think you're, you're on point there. The other thing that was interesting to me, um, and I've heard this concept used before, and while this exact language wasn't used, it was referenced in some of the research. And that's the concept of making the room bigger, which is the same thing that you're saying is like, we get smaller. And so the, the idea was, if you are helping someone and they are physically backed into a corner, and now we're standing in front of them, the room feels very small to them. And so how do we reposition ourselves and reposition them in a room? Can we say like, there's this couch in the middle of the room. Would you like to come sit here instead of being in the corner? And so by just moving them and moving ourselves, we're making the room feel bigger to them. We're not moving four walls, but we're making the room bigger and creating more space. And so I think that does connect to what you're saying. How do we make ourselves a little bit smaller so that there's more room for them? Um, I can imagine that would be a challenge if you were like a six foot six man negotiating with a, a student or a smaller person. Gosh, how do we adjust our own body so that we don't have that power dynamic over them? Yeah, good insight. And it did show up in quite a bit of the research. Thank you. Thank you. Another question from the chat, Leslie shared, I would like to hear more about how understanding our own feelings in a conflict can clue us into what the other person is feeling. Can you give an example? Oh, I don't know if I can give an example. Um, I, I was really intrigued by it because I think my gut reaction is ignore what I'm feeling, but really my feelings are a clue. So if I'm feeling a little bit tearful, then there's a hint there that there's something sad happening in this interaction. If I'm starting to sweat and perspire, I'm starting to feel, gosh, there's a real fear present in this moment. And so being aware that I don't need to take that on, but it's a clue for me. If, if I can tap into my logical, rational brain and I feel this, then it's probably magnified exponentially for them. And it's just, it's just an indicator. Um, to me, I think of it a little bit like baking a recipe. If I can taste a little salt in that, there probably is some salt in that. So what am I feeling in this moment that's giving me a clue to what's going on on a larger scale for someone else? So I don't know that I have a good example other than it's just, it's giving us a hint. If we can feel it, they probably feel it exponentially. Yeah, great question. Okay. Another question from the chat from Teresa. What might these strategies look like in a meeting with multiple participants and oh. one participant is escalating? Yeah, I think in that situation, you've got to get it down to one-on-one. -on -one. Because again, if that person is feeling fearful and fe feeling in danger and we've got 10 people in the room, we got to get those, we got to get those people out of the room. Um, that, that to me starts to feel like a, it's one on 10 situation and I've really got to come out fighting. Um, and, and I realize the work context is so complex and what's, what are our cultural norms and how do we handle this stuff? But 
to me, to not clear the room and, and get one-on-one -on -one where we can really deal with what that person is feeling. Because again, remember, we're all contributing to that moment of crisis. And so if we, even if we're deeply aware, if there are nine other people in the room who are clueless, they are adding to that crisis in some really unhealthy ways. Just a couple minutes left. Any other last questions? Hey, seeing none, I know Molly, we appreciate you sharing your contact info so folks have final questions. Yeah. Char, anything you want to add here at the end? Um, I just want to remind everybody that we have on February 2nd in the afternoon, um, a session on how to use circles in organizations. And then our next noon workshop is on February the 8th, which is managing groups and teams. And I'm sure a lot of what Molly had to say today relates to that as well. So Molly, this was absolutely excellent. And you got my brain working, which thank you so much for that. Um, <laughs> some great ideas. Good. Thank well, thank you. you for having me. I appreciate it. Have a great afternoon, everybody.